Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Franca, for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Alice. I'm a um, public health physician from uh, from Italy, and uh, um, I'm currently working as a postdoc at the University of Sydney in a research group called um, Evidence Policy and Influence Collaborative, led by Professor Lisa Bero. Uh, one of the topics that we work on is uh, bias in research and uh, research integrity. So we use both uh, qualitative and quantitative methods to examine how funding sources and conflict of interest can influence the design, the conduct, and publication of health-related research. So this includes uh, pharmaceutical research, environmental research, nutrition research, tobacco control research. And here at the bottom of these slides, you can see a link to our webpage if you're curious to know a little bit more about our work. So uh, we have a little bit of a challenge in front of us today. This is our situation. There are thousands of kilometers between you and me. So this lecture is kind of a challenge for me because I usually like to interact with the audience. But as you can imagine, this time I cannot do this because I'm kind of trapped behind this uh, screen. So I think that in order for this to work, we need to do kind of a, to make a sort of a deal. I'll do my best to speak slowly. I'm a very fast speaker, so I'll try to slow down and I'll take some breaks. So once in a while, I'll stop, I'll stop sharing the screen and I'll give you time to ask for, for a question uh, and also to check on you because I can't see you guys. So I have no idea whether you maybe are falling asleep while I speak or maybe you all leave the room because you are too bored about what I'm saying. So I will need some feedback. So I can hear you only if you speak on a microphone. So please uh, come to the microphone whenever we take these little breaks. If you have questions or if you don't agree with something that I've said, please come and, and talk to me. So I hope this uh, makes sense to you. And let's start. And I would like to start actually with a little bit of a story, um, the story of how I got interested in certain uh, topics, the topics that I'm going to talk about today. So I was a fifth year medical student at the University of Bologna, and I know there are some students in the audience today, so maybe some of you will relate to my, uh, to my story. So I was a fifth year medical student when I attended a seminar at the University of Bologna. It was a seminar in the evening organized by a public health uh, physician, and the topic of this seminar was conflict of interest in the medical profession. And the speaker, who is the coordinator of the No Grazie group, I will tell you about this group uh, later during this talk. So the speaker illustrated multiple examples of the strategies that the pharmaceutical industry uses to influence health policy, to influence scientific research and professional practice. It was just a two hours lecture, guys, but for me, it was kind of a turning point because from that moment, I kind of opened my eyes and the day after, when I went back to the hospital for my internship, I started noticing the pervasive presence of pharmaceutical companies in the everyday life of a health professional. From the daily contact with drug reps to the pens, flip books and many other weird gifts that find their ways into the doctor's office. And the weird thing is that I had witnessed all of this before, up to that day, but until that seminar, uh, no one had ever told me to question these practices. For me, they were normal. They were a natural part of the life of a health professional. And I had no idea of the potential consequences of certain types of interaction between physicians and um, pharmaceutical companies. So after that lecture, I decided to um, study a little bit on this topic. So I read several articles, books, and then I decided to work with other medical students to raise awareness on this issue and to advocate for the introduction of topics related to conflict of interest and pharmaceutical promotion in the curricula of medical students. So this is how my interest on corporate influence on health uh, started. And then I decided to do a PhD a few years later, actually at the University of Insubria, and this gave me the opportunity to explore a little bit more this uh, issue of corporate influence on health. And corporate influence on health is actually the first, um, let's say, topic that I will touch on during this lecture. So this is the content a little bit of my, of my lecture today. I will start with a brief introduction on the issue of corporate influence on health, which is kind of the background that you need to have in order then to understand the problem of conflict of interest in research. 
So I will then give in the second part of the lecture several examples of how conflict of interest can introduce biases in the research uh, process. And in the end, as you can see, we will have a look at some strategies to address the problem. So I hope you are ready to start. Uh, and let's start with the first, let's say, part of the lecture, a little bit of the theoretical background. Uh, so in the past decades, um, large transnational corporations have become powerful players in global markets. Multinational corporations are for-profit enterprises that uh, operate across different countries. So I'm talking about tobacco companies, pharmaceutical companies, food companies, alcohol uh, companies. And if you think about this, in the current era, almost every aspect of our lives is influenced by multinational corporations through their products, through their services, through the information that they provide us. And despite some benefits that societies might get from corporations, the potential adverse health impacts of their operations are raising strong concerns within the public health community. And why is that? Because the primary interest of the corporation is to maximize the financial, financial return for its shareholders, often with no obligation towards the society or towards the environment. And specific terms such as industrial epidemics have been created uh, to describe the risks to health posed by the behaviors of various corporations, such as tobacco industry, alcohol industry, food industries. I'm talking about this, I'm using this industrial epidemics because in this case, the vector of the disease is not a biological agent, it's not a virus, it's not a bacteria, but it's the multinational corporation itself whose strategies aimed at maximizing profits sometimes can damage the health of the public or the health of the environment. And some of you might start maybe saying that, oh, my, these are kind of conspiracy, conspiracy theories, but actually a growing body of research has examined the corporate tactics in sectors such as tobacco or alcohol, firearms, gambling, chemical extractive industries, these are very different industry sectors, as you can see from the picture in the slides. But what is interesting is that they use common methods, common strategies to maximize their profits and to reach their economic and political objectives. And, and which are these strategies? Well, this slide shows you some examples of corporate strategies to influence public health. I will not go into detail in all of this, but all of them, but for example, political influence. Corporations use multiple means to exert political influence. For example, they donate funds to political parties or they lobby to obtain a voice in policy developments in order to uh, minimize regulation or increase government protection. Uh, for example, when the United States Congress was considering a tax on soft drinks in 2009, major soda companies spent millions of US dollars in lobbying and it's not a surprise that in the end this tax was not approved. And there are many other tactics, financial tactics, legal tactics, regulatory tactics, marketing and promotion. I think I don't need to mention the major uh, marketing campaigns organized by this corporation. But today, for the purpose of this lecture, we will focus just on one specific strategy that corporations use to influence public health and to protect their interests, which is the distortion of science. This is the um, strategy that is more relevant, I think, for the topic of the course that you are attending this week. So how do corporations distort science? Well, it's been the release of many internal industry documents, uh, often as a result of litigation in the 90s, that allowed researchers to systematically examine the strategies that industry use to, to manipulate research so that they can then um, protect their business interests. These are the main strategies. So they fund and publish research that support industry interest, they try to suppress unfavorable research. They try to distort the public discourse about research, which often involves, for example, criticizing unfavorable research. They try to change or set scientific standards to serve corporate interest. And then they disseminate favorable research results to decision maker, to the lay press and to the public. And today, 
I will just have a look at some of these strategies, particularly funding of research and the publication of research. And we will have a look at how industry uses these strategies to protect their business interest. So what's the problem when a manufacturer, a corporation sponsor scientific research? Well, when a manufacturer sponsors research whose findings can have an impact on its business, well, a conflict of interest arises. Because while the primary interest of a researcher is to conduct unbiased research and then to make the findings available to the community so that hopefully they can improve people's health, well, the primary interest of a corporation is totally different. It is to maximize its revenues. And only favorable research results can do that. Negative results are not so good for the company's interest. So I've mentioned, as you have seen, this topic of conflict of interest that arises. And I think that before we dig into this topic, we need um, to stop for one second and try to define conflict of interest. So what is conflict of interest? If I were there with you, I would ask some of you maybe to give me some definitions, but I can't do that, of course, because I'm here <laughs> trapped behind the screen. But um, just try to think about one moment about this concept. Uh, conflict of interest is a noble concept that I think all of you could come up with the definition because it's part of societal wisdom. It's part of common law knowledge, like this old proverbs show. Uh, I think that these proverbs from different European countries, I think that they capture very well uh, what conflict of interest is. Uh, for example, he who pays the piper calls the tune, or only in a mousetrap can you find the cheese for free, or you don't buy the hands that feeds you. Uh, so it's conflict of interest is an old concept that is part of societal wisdom, uh, but actually its use, the use of this concept is, in science is still relatively new. Uh, the term first appeared in ethics codes in the 70s, and it took a few more years for the medical literature to start seriously paying attention to this uh, topic. Uh, in the literature, there are several definitions of conflict of interest. Today, I will use a definition developed by Thompson, who is a professor of political philosophy at Harvard University. So let's read it together one moment. Conflict of interest is a set of conditions in which professional judgment concerning a primary interest tends to be unduly influenced by a secondary interest. There are a lot of concepts in, that, in this definition, so let's try to unpack it together one moment. So what are the primary interests? The primary interests are um, the key and legal obligation of professionals. For example, if you are a doctor, your primary interest is the health of your patient. If you are a researcher, your primary interest is the validity of your research. If you are a teacher, your primary interest is the education of your students. And what are the secondary interests that could unduly influence your professional judgment? Well, for example, financial interests. Just talked up until now about the corporations. So, for example, if I am, um, for example, an academic and I'm conducting a study on statin, and at the same time I sit on the board of a pharmaceutical company that produces statins, well, this is a financial interest that could unduly influence my uh, judgment. There could be also non financial interests, such as uh, political interests or personal interest, but for the purpose of this lecture, I will only focus on financial interests. And these secondary interests are not, um, are not illegitimate in themselves, but the aim of the conflict of interest regulation is to try to prevent that this secondary factor, to prevent these secondary factors from dominating in the uh, decision-making process. And another important point uh, that emerges from this definition is that conflict of interest is a condition. It's not a behavior. And this is a very important point because it means that conflict of interest do not necessarily imply a bad behavior. So it's very different from corruption, for example. A conflict of interest is a set of circumstances that create risk. I'll try to explain this with an example that I read in another article. Uh, for example, dogs uh, generally chase cats. 
but there are also examples of these two animals living in harmony. So merely being a dog does not mean that the behavior of chasing a cat will occur. It just means that on average, dogs will chase a cat because of the condition of being a dog. So in other words, going back to our conflict of interest situation, conflict of interest is a set of circumstances, it's a set of conditions that place the affected person in a position of potentially being influenced by those circumstances. It doesn't necessarily imply a bad behavior, but it is a risk situation, a set of circumstances that creates a risk. So it's much more subtle than active bad behaviors like, for example, corruption. Oh, okay, so time for question. I will just stop sharing the video or the slides for one moment and I will check on you. How are you doing, guys? I can't see you very well. Uh, I can see only part of the, of the... Are you doing well? Can maybe someone come to the microphone and tell me whether the class is still all alive? Um, if you are asleep, if there are major questions on this part or if I'm talking too fast and you can't follow me. I would really appreciate some feedback before going on. It could be Franca or um, one of the students. Thank you, Franca. Alice, you can continue. People ask to continue the lesson and then at the end they will be have questions. Okay, okay, perfect. Perfect. Thank you for the feedback. Great. I'll go on. Uh, okay, so what are we going to do now? So we have just defined what conflict of interest mean and my topic today is talk about uh, conflict of interest and biases in, um, in scientific uh, research. So let's explore a little bit more this, uh, this topic. First of all, by bias in research, I mean a systematic error, so a deviation from the true results of a study. And let's have a look at how biases can be introduced in research. Uh, so this is, first of all, is the cycle of research. So um, each step of this uh, research process can be, uh, can be prone to, to bias. And particularly, I will show you how industry sponsorship of research can introduce biases in all the steps of the research process. And why is this phenomenal alarming? So why you should care about this problem? Because research is the basis for the development, for example, of systematic reviews, for the development of clinical guidelines, of public health guidelines, and finally, of, for the development of public health policies. So guidelines and policies should be built upon pillars of rigorous evidence. If the evidence on which these decisions are made is flawed, if the evidence is biased, then the entire foundation of this building, the entire foundation for systematic reviews, for guidelines, for policies will crumble. These are the potential consequences of bias in research. So now going back to our uh, cycle of research, we will kind of follow the life cycle of a research project and we will have a look at how each step can be um, can be prone to bias and particularly we will look at how industry sponsorship could be a key source of bias that can affect the multiple stages of the research process. And the first stage of research that can be influenced by the sponsor is the research agenda. By research agenda I mean the very initial step in conducting research uh, during which the purpose of the study is defined and uh, the research questions are selected and framed. And a bias in this very initial step in the research agenda can then affect all the subsequent stages of the research uh, process. So let's have a look at this. Um, so with some colleagues, I recently conducted a scoping review to identify and synthesize studies that explored the influence of industry sponsorship on research agendas across different fields. So we look, included studies that looked at pharmaceutical industry, at food industry, alcohol industry, tobacco industry, mining industry, and we included in total 36 articles. And what was interesting was to see that corporations actually use similar techniques across different industry sectors. In the review, we described several strategies, but now due to the time limit, I will just describe two of them. So the first strategy is that industry tends to fund research on products 
or processes or activities that can be commercialized. Probably that is not a surprise, but for example, the pharmaceutical industry tends to fund research on drugs, on devices, uh, with a focus on diseases that affect high income countries. So where there is the potential to generate higher revenues. And this is why, for example, how the 90 to 10 gap emerges. What is this 90 to 10 gap? It means that 10%, only 10% of the resources devoted to health research focus on health problems that affect low income countries, where actually 90% of the preventable deaths occur. This is a huge gap, guys, a fatal imbalance, totally unacceptable in my, in my opinion. The problem related to that, for example, is the one of neglected diseases. Neglected diseases are a group of communicable diseases that prevail in low-income countries. Uh, for example, Chagas disease or dengue or sleeping sick sickness or trachoma. These are diseases that continue to cause uh, significant morbidity and mortality. But they are not of interest for pharmaceutical companies because they affect people that are not uh, that don't have often the, the possibility to pay for drugs. And the motto is no cash, no cure. Another strategy that industry uses to shape the research agenda is to fund research that can distract from the harms of its products. And let's have a look uh, at an example from the tobacco industry. So um, the tobacco industry, especially in the 70s and in the 80s, was quite concerned because um, concerns over the second, the damages of secondhand smoke or passive smoke were being debated at that time. And so what did they decide to do? They coordinated a scientific controversy with the purpose of stopping regulation of smoking. So they did this by funding distracting research. So some tobacco companies created at the Center for Indoor Health uh, Air Research. And throughout the 90s, this center funded dozens of research projects on what? On general indoor air quality. So they funded research projects that suggested that other components of indoor air quality, like uh, dirty air filters or uh, carpet, gases coming from the carpet, are more harmful, harmful than tobacco, than secondhand smoke. So they did that in order to divert the attention from passive smoking. And then they use these findings in uh, legislative settings to support the tobacco industry position that second hand smoke was not so harmful. And there were other substances in our indoor environments that, are, that were more harmful than passive smoking. So they tried to do this in order to delay the development of smoking policies and regulations. So industry tries to influence the research agenda and tries to prioritize research topics that can support its policy position and can protect industry, for example, from litigation or from government regulation. And this might seem an old example for you because it comes from the 70s, from the 80s, the 90s, but actually we have more, much more recent, recent examples of these uh, distraction techniques. And this example comes from the nutrition area. In another study, we have analyzed more than 200 publications sponsored by um, major transnational food and beverage companies. Um, so we analyzed more than 200 publications, mostly resulting from uh, projects funded by the Coca-Cola company. And we analyzed the topics explored in these uh, publications. And interestingly, the most common topic was physical activity, sedentary behaviors, while Highly processed foods like, uh, for example, sugar sweetened beverages were studied only in 10% of this sample that we analyzed. So why is that? Well, some authors describe this phenomenon as the physical activity diversion. And they think that this could be a strategy that the food industry is using to shape the debate around obesity. So by sponsoring research on physical activity, so the companies, so manufacturer of sugar sweetened beverages are trying to shape obesity research and try to shift attention away from the role of sugar sweetened beverages in obesity and try to focus the attention on the role instead of sedentary behaviors. Physical activity is clearly important, please don't misunderstand me, but we cannot support the message that obesity is not linked to what we eat or what we drink. 
And maybe some people might say, okay, she's been talking for 10 minutes about this, but it is kind of self-evident that companies will sponsor research that is aligned with their commercial interest. But what is alarming, and I hope you can get, guys, is that the, is the influence that this can have on public health. Because by influencing uh, the research agenda, corporations can drive the evidence generation towards policy solution that will not impact their business. Think about the example I just given on tobacco, the example about the um, food industry and the physical activity. So if we end up with a lot of physical research on physical activity interventions to control obesity, and very less re little research on other interventions that, for example, aimed at changing the food environment, for example, a tax on sugar sweetened beverages, well, this type of research will support policy responses that will focus, for example, on physical activity intervention and divert attention from other types of intervention that could be more harmful for the industry interests. I uh, wanted to stop again just to see whether there are uh, questions again, uh, but if I don't hear from you, maybe I'll keep, uh, I'll keep going. Just, just let me know. I'll stop one second and drink a little bit of water. If there are questions, please come to the microphone. Okay, I assume there are no questions. So back to our um, slide on the cycle of research. So we had a bit of a look of how corporations can influence the research agenda, the research question. And now let's move from the research agenda to the following stages of the research process. process. So how, for example, the sponsor can influence the design, the methods, and the conduct of the study. And let's have a look at this interesting data from a recent Cochrane review published in 2017. So what did the authors do here? Uh, the authors analyzed whether sponsorship of drug and device studies by pharmaceutical industry uh, is associated with outcomes and conclusions that are favorable to the sponsor. And this graph shows the meta-analysis of the 25 paper that looked at industry influence on the study results. And what do they found? Do they found that they found that industry sponsored studies more often had favorable results, favorable efficacy results compared with non-industry sponsored studies. And the risk ratio, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, is 1.27. I've not included the graph, but a similar result was found when the authors analyzed the association between industry sponsorship and favorable conclusion. Again, uh, industry sponsor studies more often had favorable conclusion with a risk ratio of 1.34. So what could be the explanation for these findings? How is it possible that industry sponsor studies tend to have more favorable results, more favorable conclusion compared to non-industry sponsored studies? Well, the authors of this review say that one plausible explanation for these findings is that the, industry achieves these overly positive results through a variety of biasing choices in the design, uh, in the conduct, and in the publication of their studies. And let's have a look at this. So in a book that I would recommend you to read by Ben Goldrick, Ben Goldrick is a physician and a researcher in the UK. The book is called Bad Pharma in English, and in Italian was translated Effetti Collaterali. So in one of the chapters of this book, Ben Goldrick describes how it is possible to play, let's say, with the methods of a study in order to achieve positive results. What are these strategies? For example, you could use more often placebo control instead of an active comparator, or you could give to the, um, to the control group an inferior doses of the active comparator. So if you give any sufficient dose of the competitor product, this might increase the chance that your product will look effective. Or if you want to show, for example, that your product causes less adverse effects compared to the comparator, you can give a little bit of a lower dose of your product and a little bit of a higher dose of the, uh, of the competitor. Another strategy that you can use if you want to achieve positive results is that you can selectively choose less clinical relevant outcome as your primary outcome in order to kind of 
get, have a higher chance of achieving an effect. For example, you are studying statins and you can choose as a primary outcome instead of a clinical outcome like prevalence of cardiovascular event, you can choose a surrogate outcome like the level of LDL cholesterol, which is of course easier maybe to, to measure and, to, and to, to show a positive effect on compared to an important clinical outcome like the prevalence of cardiovascular events. Or maybe you can have a look at the results halfway and uh, maybe publish the results before the trial is finished. And I'll give you an example of this. So um, in, total, in September 2000, 2000 um, JAMA, so this prestigious journal, published an article on uh, selecoxib. So selecoxib is a COX-2 inhibitor uh, and COX-2 inhibitor are generally presumed to have um, a lower risk of causing um, peptic ulcers and other serious gastrointestinal uh, toxicity. So this trial that was immediately widely cited and widely distributed concluded that uh, selecoxib was associated with a lower incidence, as you can see from this graph, a lower incidence of complications compared to traditional anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or diclofenac. One year later, in 2001, what happened? Well, some letters published in JAMA and also an investigation in the, I think the Washington Post drew attention to the fact that these were not the complete information from that trial. The paper published in JAMA reported the results of the first six months of two separate long trials. So the industry actually did two separate trials. One compared, compared uh, selecoxib and ibuprofen, and the other one selecoxib and the versus diclofenac. And then they presented these results all together in the JAMA uh, paper. And uh, they presented actually the results only of the first six months of the trial, which show, if you look at the red um, line, that selecoxib performs better than diclofenac and ibuprofen. But actually, the trial was supposed to last longer than that. And if you look at the final results after one year, selecoxib does not perform so well compared to diclofenac and ibuprofen in terms of um, peptic ulcers. So the result, the published reports of that trial in JAMA represent a selective reporting of the actual data from the trial. And this is, should cause really strong concerns because in the meanwhile, before this was discovered, the trial was widely cited, was widely disseminated to health professionals. And this wide distribution and wide citation coincided with the sales of selecoxib really increasing. So this is really uh, a note of concern. But that's not over. Other strategies that you could use uh, if you want to get positive results is just to play a little bit with how the data are uh, presented. And I'll give you an example of this strategy too, um, which touches a little bit more on the dissemination of research than to the actual conduct. So this is a NAD for a statin that was published in a medical journal in the 90s. Um, and as you can see, this drug is proven to reduce the risk of total mortality by 30% and coronary mortality by 42%. So if you read this, you get the impression that wow, this is a miracle drug, I want to take it. I don't know about you guys, but I would take it. Uh, but actually there is a little bit more uh, on that. Uh, before we move on, I would like to reassure that this statement is true, does not contain anything that is not true. However, there are other facts just as true that might give you a little bit of a different impression on this drug. Uh, because the perception of risk and benefits both by health professionals and by lay people are strongly influenced by the way the data are presented. And especially in the case of uh, statins, of cholesterol-lowering drugs, uh, the difference between reporting the relative or the absolute risk reduction in terms of coronary heart disease can greatly influence our perception of this drug. So this ad was based just on the relative risk estimate, which usually gives a more favorable impression of the effectiveness of a drug compared to the absolute risk estimate. But the real impact of this treatment, you can only get a real idea of the impact of this treatment if you look also at the absolute risk reduction. 
And this data can be found only in the original articles and not in this ad that was published in, the, um, in a medical journal. Um, so a researcher, the author of this paper in BMJ, went back to the actual um, trial, to the original article, full article, and had a look at the absolute and relative risk. And so in his opinion, this ad should have been rewritten as this. Uh, the drug is proven to reduce the risk of total mortality by 3.3% and the absolute risk of coronary mortality by 3.5%. So the one above is the original ad with just the uh, relative risk estimates and below you can see the absolute risk reduction. Quite a different, uh, let's say, picture, a different message, uh, if you allow me to say that. And another point that can be made about this original statement in this ad is around like certainty. As you can see, the ad says it's proven to reduce the risk, which kind of gives the idea that there will be a guaranteed improvement. But in science, instead, there is considerable uncertainty with regard to which individuals will benefit from, from a drug treatment. And this uncertainty usually is illustrated by the number needed to treat. Hopefully you already took a stat class, but just for you who are not familiar, the number needed to treat is um, the number of patients that need to be treated in order for one of them to benefit, in order to prevent a bad outcome, let's say. And so um, this, uh, the author of this uh, piece in the BMJ went back to the actual trial data, to the original article, and they look at the number needed to treat, and then he added also another measure, he calculated the number of tablets needed to be taken in order to save one life. Of course, he's trying to be very provocative. So after having a look at all this data, his suggestion is to rewrite that ad uh, like this. So medicine is not an exact science. Therefore, 200 men without any prior heart disease have to swallow 357 thousands of tablets over five years to save one of them from dying from coronary heart disease. This is due to the fact that no exact knowledge exists as to whom of these 200 will benefit from the treatment. I'm trying to provoke you guys, but the meaning of all of these, the take home messages, please, please make sure that you don't just rely on, for example, a deplian that is given to you by, for example, a drug rep. Just go back to the actual article and read actually the whole article, not just abstract, and pay attention to the type of measures that are presented to you. Is it just a relative risk estimate? Please have a look at the absolute risk reduction. Please have a look at the number needed to treat in order to get a more um, complete message, a more complete picture of how uh, a drug works. And then going back to our strategies in order to get positive results, the final one is that if you end up getting results that are negative, just bury them, just hide them, avoid publishing them. This way you will have only positive results. And this brings me to the last point in our um, cycle of research, which is the problem of reporting, the problem of publication bias. Uh, so negative results are often not published in the scientific literature. And I will start talking about this problem uh, using actually a story, um, a story that uh, um, Ben Goldeck, our researcher and um, the author of the book Bad Pharma wrote. Um, so he is a medical doctor and he tells uh, the experience that he had with the patient and particularly when he was trying to prescribe a drug, an antidepressant, reboxetine. So let's read this part of the book together. Reboxetine is a drug that I have prescribed. Other drugs had done nothing for my patient, so he wanted to try something new. I read the trial data before I wrote the prescription and found only well-designed, fair tests with overwhelmingly positive results. Reboxetin was clearly a safe and effective treatment. So the patient and I discussed the evidence briefly and agreed it was the right treatment to try next. So I signed the prescription. So far so good, but actually the following sentence is, but we, both me and the patient, we had both been misled. What is he talking about? 
So uh, this German Institute for Quality and Efficiencies in Healthcare was commissioned a um, review of the benefit of antidepressants. So they conducted a systematic review of the literature, of the published literature, but they were also able to get access to unpublished data. So they asked the manufacturers of the drug to provide information not only on the published trials, but also on the unpublished trials. And when these researchers analyzed this trial, well, the picture that they got was quite different compared to what was, what was published. So seven trials were conducted on reboxetine versus placebo, and only one, the one with positive results, was published. And the situation becomes even worse if we look at the trials comparing reboxetine versus other drugs, other antidepressants. The patients on reboxetine did worse than those on other drugs. So what is the comment of Ben Goldberg after describing this? He says that I did everything that a doctor is supposed to do. I read all the papers. I critically appraised them. I understood them. I discussed them with the patient and we made a decision together based on the evidence. In the published data, reboxetine was a safe and effective drug, but in reality, it was no better than a sugar pill. And worse, it does more harm than good. As a doctor, I did something that on the balance of all the evidence harmed my patient, simply because unflattering data was left unpublished. So let's have a look at this phenomenon. This phenomenon is called publication bias. And publication bias occurs when sometimes some types of results, usually those that are statistically significant, are reported more frequently or more quickly than others in the medical literature. Uh, so as a result of publication bias, the published studies are often not a representative of all the research that has been conducted on a topic. And this means that often the, the effects that we see about a certain drug are overrated. So in this study, the authors tried to... How, how widespread is this phenomenon? In this study, the authors assessed the extent of publication bias of newly approved drugs. So when drug manufacturers want to get uh, marketing approval for a new drug, they need to submit all the studies to uh, drug regulators. In, in this case, in the US, it's a Food and Drug Administration. So the documents submitted to the regulatory agency can be helpful to identify unpublished data, comparing what has been submitted to the drug regulator and what has been published in the literature. So the authors of this study identified 164 trials uh, included in drug applications that were submitted to the Food and Drug Administration in two years, 2001 and 2002. And then they searched the literature, they searched PubMed, they searched the Cochrane Library to identify publications that corresponded to each of these trials. And what did they find? Well, they found evidence of publication bias because within five years, 78% of the trials were, uh, were published. But they did also something else, and they looked at discrepancies in reporting of primary outcomes uh, between the um, trials submitted to the FDA and the published papers. So the trials had a total of 179 primary outcomes that were reported to the FDA well, 41, 41 were omitted in the papers. And in the trials, there were 43 outcomes that were kind of negative, so they did not favor the drugs, uh, and 20 were not included in the papers. And moreover, the papers also had more outcomes, included more outcomes, you see 50, 15 additional outcomes that favored uh, the tested drug. Uh, so. I think this is really a worrisome phenomenon uh, because it shows that the information that is available in the scientific literature to healthcare professional, to researcher, is definitely incomplete and it's potentially biased. So the phenomenon of publication bias um, has contributed to a clinical literature, a scientific literature, which is dominated by studies that demonstrate that drugs are safe and effective because only published results, or maybe mostly published results, are, are, are published. And I'd like to give you another example along these lines, because the control from the sponsor of the, the, over the dissemination of the data is evident also in this Italian case. Uh, so the Mario Negri Institute, probably 
many of you know about this, is a center, an institute for pharmacological research. It is a, a non-profit foundation based in, in Milan. And in this paper on, published in BMJ in 2013, the director of the center, Garattini, and one of his colleagues, Bertelet, they expose how they withheld their involvement in a project on a product owned by GlaxoSmithKline. So GlaxoSmithKline suggested the Mario Negri Institute would be could be involved in this project. Mario Negri Institute decided not to take part in this project. Why? Because of the constraints contained in the contract written by GSK. So as you can see, Gartina Bertelli says that there was a project agreement written by GSK and attached to the study protocol set out dozens of pages of rules and conditions that would effectively have made this study a study controlled by GlaxoSmithKline and not a collaborative study. So what were these rules? Um, GSK wanted to retain the right to permit or refuse access to the patient outcome data and to give written approval for any independent publication of the data generated by the public-private partnership. This meant that we, as the researcher, would have had to ask GlaxoSmithKline permission to access, to access the data from our own trial and that GSK reserved the right to block publication of our analysis of that data at any time after the study was completed. So this means that no one would have had the right to publish anything about the outcomes of the study without the company's written consent. And I hope you allow me to say that this secrecy is completely unacceptable from a public health perspective. In research, guys, there are no positive or negative results. There are just results that are all equally important for the advancement of our knowledge, for our understanding of health and disease. So please, as a researcher or as a future researcher, you have an ethical obligation to submit your results, to publish your uh, results. Um, and so going back to our Ben Goldeck, our doctor who was so frustrated by this, by this problem of publication data, he comments on this uh, with this sentence. He says that doctors can have no idea about the true effects of the treatments they give. Does this drug really work best? Or have I simply been deprived of half of the data? No one can tell. Is this expensive drug worth the money or has the data simply been massaged? No one can tell. Will this drug kill patients? Is there any evidence that it's dangerous? No one can tell. This is a bizarre situation to arise in medicine, a discipline in which everything is supposed to be based on evidence. Quite a strong, powerful statement, I would say. So what's the final results of all the problems that I've described so far? Well, according to several researchers, the entire evidence base has been perverted. Industry-sponsored clinical research is a broken system. And bias is not a matter of few isolated cases, but it permeates the entire system. I don't know what's your reaction to this because I can't see your faces, unfortunately. Uh, but when I read this things for the first time, it was kind of an earthquake uh, for me as medical students, especially was trained to kind of trust the scientific uh, literature. So, so far in the second part of the lecture, after the theoretical background, I've given you multiple examples of how biases can be introduced in every step of the research process. And as I said, I focus mostly on, on funding uh, bias. So bias that comes from the sponsor, from a uh, commercial sponsor. But before we close this section, I would like to mention that uh, biases in research is a much more complex problem and we cannot only blame, of course, the industry for that. Uh, of course, in a one or two hours lecture, I have some limitation. I can treat only, present only some aspects of the problem, but I would like to acknowledge that there are um, also more structural determinants of the problem. It's a system problem and many actors are involved in maintaining the status quo apart from industry. So the problem of bias in research should, be, should become part of a wider debate on the structural and sometimes Perverse, perverse incentives of science. Uh, let's mention, for example, the highly competitive environment for funding, for career promotion in academia that often pushes researchers to submit predominantly positive results for publication because they hope that these positive results will be more likely cited, will increase their age index. And of course, let's think also about, for example, the scientific journals and the editors of scientific journals who are subject to 
several external pressure that kind of might increase the possibility of, of conflict of interest. For example, um, journals struggle to increase their citation index, their impact factor, and often the publication of large industry funded trials may generate many citations, may increase the journal income through the sales of reprints. So the reprints are uh, all this uh, yeah, reprint of the journal that the industry, for example, uses to disseminate the articles. These are the materials that arrive to the desk of the doctors as a promotional mate material. So just this uh, few sentences to say that this is a much more complex uh, problem uh, due to the time limit I presented potential influence of industry on these systems, but there are many core responsibilities in maintaining the status quo. And I think that it's only through a concerted efforts at different levels that these problems can be can be faced and hopefully can be solved. And this is what I will try to describe in the last part of the lecture, where after giving you all this bad news and um, making you very pessimistic, I hope to leave you with a little bit of optimism, uh, talking about some of the solutions that we can use to address the problem. But I'll stop again for, for one second and see whether you have questions for me before I move uh, on. So I'll just stop. I don't know, Franca, can you let me know if the class is still alive, if you are too tired, if you need a break, or if I can move on? And if there are questions, they're welcome. There's a question. Wait one moment. Please come here. Uh, hello, Alice. Uh, Hi. I, <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, I'm part of uh, this Padova this year. We have uh, hospitato. I don't know. Where is hospitato? Hosted. Uh, Hosted a uh, workshop on conflict of interest. And uh, uh, many of our students, uh, after the workshop, has, uh, had the um, awareness like uh, that they will be, knowing conflict of interest, uh, uh, be prevented from biases during uh, eventually some researches. Is it this uh, opinion supported by evidence? Or is like, I think uh, I didn't get your question. Can, can you repeat your, your question? Sorry, I'm not sure I got it. So the students were... Um... Uh, the question is, knowing about conflict of interest yeah. okay. does prevent uh, conflict of interest to become from potential to uh, a reality? Is there evidence? So if you know, if you know or, for example... When you read an article that there are conflict of interest from the authors, does this prevent uh, the problem? Is this the question? No, or... not, uh, not only reading, but uh, in doing a research like. Uh, are uh, researchers who, who know conflict of interest uh, prevented from biases in conflict of interest? Is there evidence uh, for this opinion? Oh, okay. Uh, that's a good question. I am not sure. I think that awareness is, of course, uh, the first... Uh, um, the first issue and there is a lot of work to do on that because probably you are medical students i don't know but i mm, had not been exposed to these topics during my uh, my training as i told you it was just because i randomly went to that to that uh, conference in the evening uh, to that seminar in the evening at the university of bologna when i was a fifth year medical student that I discovered all of this. I had no idea about this. So I think that awareness is the first thing. And um, these are topics that are still uh, hugely neglected in the training of health professionals, of researchers. So at least awareness of the problem is the first uh, thing. Uh, but I think that only awareness is not enough. Uh, we need something more. And maybe if you allow me, I'll go into my strategies and tell you a little bit more about uh, what uh, the system needs to do in order to prevent conflict of interest to generate bias. I think that researchers cannot or doctors cannot be left alone in this. We need to be protected by our institution. We need some firewalls, some, um, yeah, I would say some, some policies that I'm going to discuss in a moment that protect us. Uh, for example, think about the, um, the case that I described before about the Mario Negri Institute and GlaxoSmithKline. So GlaxoSmithKline arrives to you with this project agreement. 
you're not, if you're the Mario Negri Institute, if you're Silvio Garattini, maybe you are in the position of saying, no, I will withheld from this partnership, but you are alone. I don't think you sometimes have the power to, to, to do that. Also because maybe you know that if you say no, well, these funds will go to another colleague of you. So there are, I think, structural determinants of the pro uh, that kind of maintains the problem. And this is why researchers cannot be left alone. Uh, they need to be protected by um, policies, institutional policies. And I will tell you a little bit more about this in one second, in one of the next slides about solutions. I hope I kind of answered your question. If you have any, you said that you had another one. Do you want to wait until the end and come then back to ask it? Shall I move on or? So Alicia, you can continue and- uh, Thank you, thank you Franco for, for your assistance. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, I'll move on to the last bit and then we can have hopefully a little bit more of a chat. Let me check the timing. Okay, so you're still plenty of time. Okay, few more slides. Hope you can resist and then we can have another chat. Um, okay. So, uh, what can we do about this? So, I really appreciated this uh, the question that I've just received because it brings me uh, to the last part of the um, solutions. I think that in order to generate change, we need top-down and bottom-up strategies. By top-down strategies, I mean system strategies. Mm, and I will start with this one. And then bottom-up strategies are strategies that involve more researchers, doctors, and you also, you guys. So let's start with the top-down solutions. Clearly, the best antidote to corporate influence on science would be to increase funding for independent research. I can already guess that, I, I'm guessing that maybe some of you will say, oh, she's crazy, she's just idealistic. Where do we get the money for independent research? I agree with you, the economic crisis had a profound effect on the availability of resources for research. Research funds are scarce, but I think that we need to bo be bold and we need to be brave and think about innovative solutions. For example, the Italian medicine agency, IFA, years ago, well, they launched a program to support independent research on pharmaceuticals. And the most interesting aspects of this program was its funding mechanism. How was this program funded? So they asked, they required pharmaceutical manufacturer to contribute 5% of their annual marketing expenditure. So you are a drug company, you spend X amount of money on marketing. Each year, well, you give me 5% to this um, central repository. And this allowed IFA to mobilize millions of euros to fund necessary research, research that on topics that usually would not be funded by industry. For example, pharmacopidemiology studies or head-to-head -head comparison of drugs. This was such an interesting model and I think we could implement it also in other research areas besides pharmaceuticals. What about asking food corporation to also donate 5% uh, of their yearly marketing expenditure so that we can maybe fund independent research on obesity, for example. So that's the first solution in my opinion. The second opinion would be sometimes to just ban corporate funding. Some scientific institutions, for example, have stopped accepting funding for research from tobacco companies. It is too risky to just engage with the tobacco industry. So they decided to ban, to stop accepting funding from tobacco companies. And the University of Sydney, where I work, is one of these institutions. And I think that similar restrictions should be considered also for other types of uh, academic corporate relationships. Another solution that has been proposed to manage uh, the risk uh, when corporation funds research is to create blind trusts at, the, at an institutional level. So if corporation wish to support research, for example, at the University of Insubria, well, they could contribute to a blind trust, so a central repository that then would distribute these funds for, to, 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 to researchers for independently approved research process. So this would kind of break the link between the sponsor and the researcher because the sponsor gives money to this pool and then there is an independent committee that um, distribute these funds to, to researcher. 
That's an interesting proposal, but the problem is that uh, there is the risk that the corporate funding for research will decrease because corporations carefully assess the impact of their investments. And the blind trust would not allow them to have any control on the, on the study or on the topic that would be, would be funded. And this uh, is the, another important solution. And this kind of answers, so this is probably my answer to, to your question, to the question that one of you just raised. Um, researchers cannot be left alone uh, or health professionals in general, when they have to interact with commercial sponsors. Research institutes should develop broader policies to regulate the interaction with all the commercial ent entities. What I mean by that? Well, an example comes from the center where I work. I work at the center called Charles Perkins Center, which is a research center within the University of Sydney. Well, this center has developed guidelines for engagement with industry. And the center has set up an ad hoc committee in charge of uh, as conducting a risk benefit analysis for all the projects that involve industry partners. So whenever a corporation or a commercial sponsor comes to, to the center and says, I would like to fund uh, research on this, or I would like to interact with this researcher, well, this proposal is assessed by this ad hoc committee. And the committee conducts a risk benefit analysis. For example, they assess what's the alignment of this commercial sponsor with the mission of our center? What's the level of harm generated by the product of the sponsor? Do we want to get the, kind of to, to start working with a partner who, I don't know, produce this type of products, for example, tobacco industry? Uh, and they also consider the reputational risk to our center if we decide to enter into an agreement with this sponsor. And if the funding source is not aligned with the mission of our center or is considered too high of a risk, the funding is not allowed. I think this is an interesting example that could become a model also for other research institutes. So this is what I meant before when I said that researchers cannot be left alone. They need to be protected by this type of policies so that the, the decision is not just up to them, but there is like a system behind them, a structure uh, that protects them from dangerous, let's say, interactions. Another strategy that I think is more very important is transparency. Transparency does not solve the problem of industry influence on health, on research, or, but it's still, I think, a fundamental strategy that allows to bring conflicts of interest to light. I think that uh, when we read an article, no reader of a scientific article should ever guess who funded the study or whether the authors have financial conflict of interest. This information should always be disclosed in every piece of research. Um, so journals, uh, major scientific journals have now developed uh, policies on disclosures and they require that the funding source and the author's conflict of interest are disclosed when the authors submit the paper for, uh, for consideration by, by the journal. But I think that the current system for disclosures is still fragmented. These policies are not implemented consistently across all the scientific journals. So we need to kind of enforce them, make them more robust. And I would go even farther and say that failure to comply with this disclosure requirement should be considered a scientific misconduct committed by both the journals and the author. So disclosure is one of the most frequently used strategy but does not prevent bias in research. And actually, according to, to some authors, it could have also some uh, limitations, some, let's say, adverse effects. Because, for example, the disclosure might be perceived as absorbing the person from the responsibility to manage them, the conflict of interest. So I've disclosed, so it's enough. I've done what I was required to do. Now I can go back to do whatever I was doing. Uh, and the other problem, but disclosure does not solve the problem, it just exposes, brings conflict of interest to light, but it doesn't solve the problem. And the other um, problem is that um, evidence that emerged from the social sciences suggests that disclosure could also not only be ineffective, but could be regressive. What do I mean? So um, George Lowenstein have argued that disclosure actually can lead doctors to give biased advices through a psychological mechanism called strategic exaggeration. I'll give you an example because, for example, if I have to give you today a talk about statins and I disclose to you that I have um, financial ties 
with the manufacturer of statins. I know that because of this, because I disclose this, you will be more critical about what I'm going to say. You might potentially discount some of the things that I say. So I will exaggerate this benefit. It's just a psychological mechanism. I will exaggerate the benefit of statins just to counteract your discounting. So I hope it's clear that disclosure is clearly important, it's necessary, but it has some kind of adverse effects and it's not sufficient. But along the lines of transparency, I would like to mention another important advancement from the recent years. So we know that financial ties between researchers, between health professionals and the pharmaceutical manufacturers have long been at the center of international debate. And these concerns have led to uh, a range of national policies aimed to, ex to, to, to ensure um, greater disclosure of payments to health professionals. For example, in 2013, uh, the United States implemented this uh, law, this Physician Payment Sunshine Act. It's a legislation that was passed in 2010 and requires drug and device companies to declare uh, all the payments and hospitality to medical doctors uh, with a value of more than 10 US dollars. So all these payments are available in a searchable database called Open Payments. And this has been really a, a really important advancement because analysis of these some transparencies have allowed to show how widespread are industry payments to medical doctors. And they've also allowed analysis that show how, for example, doctors who receive more payments tend then to prescribe more drugs, tend to prescribe drugs differently, let's say, from the colleagues who don't. This is one of these analyses who show that the more money that the doctors receive, actually these are not just money, but are meals. So um, this study involved, uh, I think, 280,000 physicians in the US and found that even a single sponsored meal uh, was associated with an increased prescribing of promoted brand medication. And as you can see, the prescribing of the promoted brand increased with the number of meals this, um, received. So number of meals means that there, there has been an interaction with the industry, whether you had been uh, invited to an educational event, whether food were provided, was provided or to a dinner. So there is an association. Of course, this doesn't show any causal, um, causal link. It doesn't prove that industry payments to doctor uh, brings to more prescription, but it shows that payments are associated uh, with an approach, a different approach to, to prescribing, as you can see. Uh, so this is very important advancement in the US. What happens in Europe in terms of transparency? The situation is still quite heterogeneous. There are some countries that have adopted a legislation like the US, similar, let's say, to the US. For example, France or Portugal. I think that there are some Portuguese students among you, so you might be happy to hear that. Other countries instead, for example, Italy, do not have currently a legislation, but there is just a voluntary disclosure uh, system, which is not as comprehensive as the, um, for example, as the US one, and also in terms of data access, there are some, some problems. But I won't go into detail, but I know that there has been some debate uh, in the parliament about the possibility to introduce also a Sunshine Act in Italy. So uh, let's hope that this discussion will bring to some um, important changes. Another important um, strategy that I'd like to talk to you is the open access to data. I think this is quite important in order to address the problem of publication bias. So All Trials is a project that advocates uh, that clinical research adopts the principles of open, open research. And the projects can be summarized as all trial registered, all results reported. So what is this campaign, campaign asking for? All trials is asking for, for example, registration of clinical trials. Clinical trials should be registered in specific registry with a summary of the trial protocol. Before even the first participant is recruited, the trial and the protocol should be registered in one of these uh, registry. For example, the European Commission now requires that any trials of medicinal product conducted in a European country needs to be registered in this uh, European Union Clinical Trial Registry that is administered by the European Medicine Agency, which is a drug regulator. 
this is very important to address the problem of publication bias. Because if you think about this, if the trial is registered, then we can have a look at whether the results have been published in the literature or whether they mysteriously disappeared and what type of data have been published. Did the authors publish everything that they said they would do in the protocol? Did they hide some outcomes? Did they publish only the first six months instead of the whole 12 months? This is a key um, strategy to address the problem of publication bias. And then another request of the old trials campaign is the summary results reporting. So a summary of the results of the trial should be published where the trial is registered within one year of completion of the trial. So by summary, we mean the primary and the secondary outcome measure and the statistical uh, analysis. Uh, this is, if you think about this, this is so important because millions of patients volunteer for clinical trial and they expect that the findings will, I don't know, bring new knowledge and will benefit uh, future patients. And so publishing every result is an ethical responsibility to patients in clinical trial. How is the situation in this regard? Well, um, the situation is not super good. So um, in the um, Goldacre, the author of Bad Pharma has recently conducted this, uh, this study where he looked at whether um, the trials, <clears throat> he looked at around 7,000 7, trials and looked at whether uh, they meet the requirement of the European Union. So the requirement is that um, the trials of any medicinal product should be registered and then um, the sponsor needs to disclose the result within 12 months of trial completion. And he looked at whether um, this last requirement was met for more than 7,000 trials. And actually he found that the compliance is still poor with half of the trials not uh, compliant, uh, not compliant. And interestingly, actually in his study, the pharmaceutical companies showed a higher rate of compliance with this rule of publishing the results within 12 months in the trial registry compared to other sponsors, such as university, who had particularly low reporting rates. And I think that um, probably the absence of a formal legal sanction uh, is still one of the problem for this, one of the maybe explanation for this poor compliance. So these were some of the strategies that I wanted to show you on how we could generate change, probably from the, let's say, top down, some top down strategies. But I think that we need also bottom up strategies. And I think that um, when it comes to the problem of industry, the relationship between industry and health professional, a beacon of light is represented by the, by the experiences of several groups, groups of health professionals, group of medical students around the world who are working as watchdogs. So they pay attention to corporation, to their behavior. They try to expose bad behavior. They try to disseminate information around this topic. Um, and these are some of these groups. For example, um, Medis in Germany, No Grazia in Italy. I'm part of this group. And if you are interested, please have a look at our website, join our group and join our activities. No, Gra no Gracias in Spain, uh, Medico Sin Marca in Chile. And then there are also a lot of students, some, some interesting students groups like the American Medical Student Association who launched this campaign called Pharma Free. This group have been really great in, um, in raising awareness on the issue of conflict of interest and they also advocated for less involvement of pharmaceutical companies in research and in clinical practice. And I think that the experience of some students association is particularly interested. For example, the American Medical Student Association has produced a scorecard that annually assesses medical students, medical schools, conflict of interest policy. So they analyze the medical school in, in the US and they assess whether they have conflict of interest policies and they have just some categories that they assess, for example, whether um, they, these, these schools allow, uh, for example, industry sponsored educational events on campus, whether there are uh, rules on conflict of interest disclosure within these academic institutions. And they assess each school according to these uh, criteria. This scorecard is, sorry, the, I'll go check the light, sorry. Okay, sorry. It's very late, as you can see here at the University of Sydney, it's probably almost 9 p.m., so they're shutting down the lights. <laughs> I'm the only one probably in the building. Um, 
So what I was saying is that, um, sorry, I got distracted. So they assess at the medical schools according to all these criteria. And this scorecard has generated a lot of media attention and has been very successful also in influencing the development of policies at several universities. I would love to see something like this uh, in Italy done by maybe medical students. So this shows, this just to tell you that uh, bottom-up movements can become catalysts for, for policy change. So I'm going to close here. I just would like to conclude maybe saying that um, I've just shown some of the problems, I've just, show, I've just shown some of the solutions. I think it is unlikely uh, that uh, um, certain types of uh, relationship, partnership between the industry and the researchers will stop, of course, and maybe we don't need them to, to be always brought, be brought to an end. But I think that uh, these forms of collaboration can still be extensively uh, reframed so that they happen in an environment that reduces the possibility of conflict of interest, in an environment that boosts transparency, and in an environment that encourages ethical ways of interacting with industry. That's my, my hope, at least. Thank you for your attention and 